actually for me the way it it came about or uh, showed itself in my life was that I really struggled with relationships um with friendships um there was always this separation between me and other people so although I could make many many friends and acquaintances at a superficial level and although I cared about people it was really hard to connect further than that a phrase i often use is everyone has a story. And I really mean that, everyone without exception. And you never truly know somebody until they share their story. Ashley is no different. She definitely has a story, an unusual story, and an experience at a very, very young age that perhaps not that many people have gone through. She's doing amazing some of the things that she has learned to overcome, some things that she's still having to deal with today. You will be inspired when you hear all the things that Ashley, at a very young age, has had to deal with. A very talented lady with an incredible creative mind doing many different things to help others. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Ashley. How are you today? I'm really well, thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me on. I'm very excited to be speaking with you today. Thank you so much at very, very short notice to come on this podcast because we, we literally connected with each other on LinkedIn yesterday. Um, and I was just reaching out to other podcasters to see if they would be interested in doing an exchange in terms of getting on each other's podcast. So I really appreciate you kind of jumping in going, yeah, I'll do it. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, Michael. I think it's a really important point, actually, um, which I'm sure listeners will hear about in a few minutes, but you've got to take opportunities that come up for you and see what you can be involved in and just have a yes attitude. Uh, it can actually be really fun. Oh, I, I love the yes attitude. I had um, the best example of that was, um, oh, Will Smith. I don't know. He went through a year of saying yes, and he did a bungee jump out of a helicopter, believe it or not. And when I saw that video, I went, that guy's completely crazy. He's got a young family. And because he said yes, because somebody challenged him, he went and did that. So I suppose there is a limit how many things I will say yes to. <laughs> and that That's one isn't one. The, the, the bungee jump, I would never say yes to. <laughs> That's a really good point about saying yes. Yes, uh, sometimes we do need to say no. It's a lesson that I always am trying to learn. And um, you'll hear more about my story and why it's hard for me to say no. Mm. But actually, I I love opportunities and, and I'm more guilty of taking on more than I can chew than saying no. Mm. So um, I think it's also a personality trait for me. I just love to be busy and I find so much uh, happiness and fun in a bit of chaos. So uh, it is fascinating to me talking to people and hearing how we're all different and how, you know, um, different colleagues or, or friends or, or other students like myself approach their workload or their um, social activities, friendships, relationships. Um, the human mind is so fascinating and how uh, how and what we've been through can shape us so much in what we enjoy. So I think this will be a really fun fun theme to chat about through our podcast today. Definitely, definitely. Okay, well, thank you for that tiny bit of introduction and a bit of kind of insight into you. I, I really like that. I'm going to start with one big question and then hand over to you, and that is, Tell us, the listeners, a little bit about your personal life to begin with. So where were you born? A bit about your education and your journey in and out of that. Where you now live? Have you moved around the UK? Um, anything like that that might be interesting for us to know about. So over to you, Ashley. 
Okay, thank you, Michael. So this might take a few minutes because I've got such a long story. <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> um, so I'm originally from South Africa. Um, I was born in Johannesburg and I'm actually, uh, it's curious to me because I feel like a little bit of a, uh, not an outcast, a misfit, a misfit, shall we say, mm. because I grew up between South Africa and Zimbabwe as a young child. Um, we moved to the UK when I was 14. And my heritage is a real mix. So m both my mom and dad are um, white South African, white Zimbabwean. And so our family, three, four generations back, are all um, uh, all born in South Africa or Zimbabwe. So it's it's quite strange for me because... I'm from an African land, but I'm mm. not African, but in mm. my heart I am. So that's really curious because um, uh, looking at my heritage, I have a mix of French and Dutch, so French Huguenot, uh, the Afrikaans um, uh, community in, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I also have uh, uh, Irish, Scottish, and English. So it really is quite broad. And when I look back at my family history, I think, well, what did they do? And in terms of things like colonialism, I think, well, have my family been part of that? I don't know, you know, and it's kind of awkward um, thinking about all this stuff because race relations is very important to me. Mm. So one thing to talk about in terms of my value system or the things that are important is I remember being around six years old and it was apartheid. Uh, it was just coming to an end. Um, actually, it was 1994. And um, Nelson Mandela was being inaugurated and voted in. And around that time, I have really strong memories of seeing people queuing in huge lines. And um, I remember my dad has always been really into the news and um, watching the news with him and seeing people queuing for hours and mm. singing and dancing in all many colors and different outfits of every color, creed and religion holding hands and hoping for this new world, this new South Africa rainbow nation. Yes. Um, and actually, a few years later, it was 1997, I believe. Um, I might be wrong, but I think it was 97 when the Rugby World Cup South Africa won. Yes. And it was just such a huge moment as a country. Um, actually, it's just been repeated recently with the I recent know. World Cup. I know. I yeah. know. Um, so, but I mean, for me, rugby really connects people from all walks of life and cultures and backgrounds. So, um, so th these are some of my strongest kind of memories. And for me, race relations is very important. So I think it's important when talking about myself to consider, well, where do I fit in the world? Yes. And part of that has left me with this massive um, heart for people from many backgrounds, all mm. backgrounds really. Um, and I'm just passionate about people. So that's kind of how that has started as a, as a younger child, um, always wanting to know more about anybody and where they've come from. Right. Um, so similar to that is um, right from being a very small child, I've always done a lot of charity work. Um, my grandmother started a um, something called the Salem Baby Care Center when I was before I was born, actually. So what she used to do is go out with her car and give people blankets and food on the streets. Mm -hmm. And as she started to grow and things started to, you know, um, people started to hear about it, eventually she was supported with some premises. And what she would do is help women with babies, particularly babies with AIDS, um, who maybe didn't know how to look after themselves or their babies or didn't have food or... Um, you know, blankets or skills or anything like this. Right. And so what her program did was teach the mothers how to sew so that they could have an income stream through creating beautiful crafts mm. um, and then also, uh, you know, helping them to learn how to look after their babies and wash them and, you know, look for things like lice and, and stuff like this and um, really just – uh, facilitate the transfer of charitable donations from Nestle or Johnson & Johnson, all these big sponsors, to um, the communities that needed them. Yes. And so right from a very young age, I was involved, um, I, I think the earliest memories, maybe six or seven, but wow. you know, in wrapping gifts and giving them out and playing with the children and doing songs in the crash. Um, and I loved it. It was really special to me. And I never, I guess for me, I never saw... 
um, I never saw the differences until I'm an adult. Right. Um, but for me, um, being involved in community work has always been a really strong push, and I think I get that from my grandmother. Right. Um, so that, that, those are two kind of big things about me. So I guess to let you know, at 14, I moved to the UK. Yeah. And that was hugely challenging because I had made lots of friends in South Africa. I was very popular. I was very involved in sports and drama and ballet and I was a prefect at school and, you know, I had really strong connections. Um, also, South Africa uh, at the time um, was quite conservative in many ways. And so I, you know, I, I was um, from a very Christian background. Um, coming to the UK, it was an extraordinary culture shock for me at 14. Yes. So I'm arriving in the UK my first class at school is French <laughs> and I'm learning French from somebody who speaks with a Geordie accent in a school in Sunderland who are called Mackhams. So really confused about what's going on. Mm. And I've never spoken French before, never learned it. I, you know, I did see that as a fabulous opportunity, but um, I was used to speaking, you know, tribal languages um, from South Africa. So Kosa, Zulu, Tutu, um, Afrikaans, these other languages. And yes. South Africa is interesting because there's 13 national languages, one, three, 13. Um, what that means is that it, it's a strange culture in that we we kind of speak in South Africa in um, many languages at once. Uh, so there will be many uh, different elements of different um, uh, languages like Zulu, which might uh go into everybody's speech. Yeah. So whether, you, whether you're white or black or any particular demographic, you might still use other languages that aren't particularly with your race. Understand, um, yeah. So it's a very interesting uh, community and culture. Um, community is not the right word, culture, to, to live in. Mm. And um, so my first lesson being French was really quite intimidating I also remember the kids saying, you know, what's it like to wear real clothes and not loinskins? <gasps> and I just used to think, like, what on earth? And you know what? I really don't think it was a case of um, them just pretending. I, I actually genuinely think some of the kids did think that. Um, yes. I think nowadays the world is getting smaller you know social media people can google there's so many amazing things that you can see all the time about yeah. many things happening all over the world but i think at that time it was 2000 2001 and for some 14 year olds in the class i don't think they had to ever thought outside the uk no. um so also you know um many of the kids were going out and smoking weed and you know uh fooling around in the cemeteries and the bushes and mm. all this kind of thing mm. and drinking and for me this was just so far removed from anything i had experienced growing up and what i knew was kind of right yeah um so i felt that to be quite a huge uh, change um and i felt quite isolated because I had also always been very involved in sport and um, in dance and in other activities, you know, drama and things like this. Yeah. But um, moving to the UK was very expensive for my family. Um, and actually, all of those beautiful activities I'd been involved in mm. were now an extreme privilege that I'd had the opportunity to, to participate in. Yes. Um, you know, sport after school. This was something that only elite schools seemed to do. Um, there were some activities at my school, but I don't feel like I was really um, made aware of them or knew how to engage with them at that time. Right. And so it was it was a very interesting time for me. Um, so moving on from that, um, I think it's the, I'm trying to, to let you know what I can in the quickest way. So no, that's fine. <laughs> I think what I can probably say is at 18, after being at college where I did kind of find myself lots of friends and I, I just had so much fun, oh, great. I started being quite a party animal, I will say, mm -hmm. um, which was quite funny because uh, it's very different to how I was when I came to the UK. I think after several years of being in the UK and I think 
you know, it's a thing many people do at a young age. I just loved the opportunity to go out and make friends and that sense of independence. And I loved all of the colors that you would find at a rave or at a club where everyone would be in many colors. There'd be music, dancing, and it just it felt wonderful to go somewhere where everyone greeted you and recognized you and you felt yes. special. Um, so, yeah, I, I had this wonderful time of partying. And then I decided to move to Leeds for university right? with my friend Joe. And we were so excited about going to Leeds and it was going to be the best three years ever. So um, this is an important thing to let you know about because things didn't quite go to how we expected in Leeds. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, it was the most wonderful city. We were out all the time. You know, we really enjoyed it there. I was doing journalism right. at Leeds and All Saints University, which is a great university. It's very small, um, but it's actually off campus. And it was hard because um, my friend, Joe, and others were in the city at Leeds University and Leeds Met. Yes. Um, whereas I was at uh, Trinity and All Saints, which feels almost like its own little island. I mean, it's, it's a tiny campus in this village outside of Leeds, about 40 minutes on the bus. Right. And it just felt so isolating because everybody knew everything about you. So it was probably good, um, like many uh, US universities, and that was a very small. But um, I felt like I was just in a dormitory, in a room on a corridor, um, really, really alone. Um, and so uni was quite difficult for me at that stage, but it became more difficult when um, my best friend was actually murdered. So that is Joe, who I went to Leeds with, yeah. was um, was actually murdered in his in his home uh, in Leeds, where he lived with other students who happened to be at Leeds Festival or away that weekend. Right. Um, and it was a burglar who he didn't know Joe. He just broke into his house, mm. and it was um, you know he was looking for uh, anything he could buy or sell to feed his heroin fix. Um, right. So it's really tragic because Joe wasn't in the wrong place. You know, he wasn't out in a bad alley or walking no. through the park late at night. He was in a home that he felt safe in. Yeah. And it's just extremely tragic. Um, and the hardest part about that um, particular time is that I was one of Joe's close friends from Newcastle living in Leeds, uh, mm with him or, or who knew his other friends and for many of, of the friendship group we were in uh, invited for regular meetings with the police yes. uh, when I say meetings I don't mean meetings I mean um, investigative uh, discussions with interviews the yeah interviews yeah one-on-one uh, -on -one, you know um, we didn't know who to trust at this point we didn't know it was a burglar you know many people are murdered by someone they know yeah um, this kind of um shock of of horror just kind of rippled through our friendship groups and it was a really difficult time mm. and actually for me that that whole situation devastated me uh, irrevocably and I actually quit university I quit a job I was doing mm -hmm. uh, I just kind of lost interest in everything um and I look back now and I think, how did we get through that? Because it was really mm. tough and mm. not just for us as friends, um, but his family, you know, um, they, they left their beautiful son in, in a house that he was so happy to live in with yes. his friends. Yeah. And, and then the next time they see him, you know, they see him to identify him and it's just really horrific. So that, I mean, that that's 10 years ago, mm. but as Result, I did struggle with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, a lot of that was not just the fact of something like this happening, but just the experience of going for interviews with the police. You know, at, at 21, you don't know how to handle yourself in those situations. No. Or, um, what you should or shouldn't talk about or, you know, just, just simple things that you don't realise. Um it can be really hard. So, you know, I, I had tremendous family and friends supporting me through that time. 
Um, and I, you know, since then I've, I've had a lot of therapy, mm. um, which has been hugely helpful. Um, there's, there's something called EMDR. It's eye movement desensitization processing. Right. So this really helps you to process traumatic incidents so that you don't have the, tr- you don't have the, the sense of the feelings that you used to when you recall them. Right. Um, it's used with refugees, uh, people who've gone through disaster situations like hurricanes and floods and, mm. you know, really, really challenging, um, circumstances and i have to say i really think that saved my life um and for what happened to joe you know we lost the most beautiful spirit and friend and person yeah and so in terms of my education and where i've come from and what i've done Mm. i kind of lost it all at this stage and i just i didn't know where to go or what to do so I started waitressing um, at Nando's, which is brilliant. I love Nando's. They have been so um, important in my personal journey uh, in my career. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, while I was at Nando's, I worked my way up from all across all functions of the restaurant, whether it was in the grills, you know, cooking in the kitchen or preparing chicken or whether it was in the front of house and um, waitressing or whatever it might be. Yes. Um, staff representative roles nationally or you know mm-hmm. and training staff i went to open the first nando's in Carlisle, which mm-hmm. is wonderful mm-hmm. um so for me th- having a place that i could kind of go do my shift work hard get paid and that really carried me through that that tough time yes um and a, a few years later i got to the point where you know i always had the situation where i always wanted more i had this hunger and i didn't know how to fill it. Mm-hmm. So I I decided um, that I would go and apply to be a temp and I started doing some temp work at Newcastle University as a receptionist on the lowest kind of grade, lowest level um, of administrative support. Yeah. And at this point, I was still very lost. Um, uh, uh, you know, it had been maybe two years since the murder. I, I was still just really um, shattered inside. And I was so fearful every day of my life. Yeah. Um, I would, I think people, when they hear of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, they think that you just get angry or fly off the handle. Mm. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the main way that people see it. Yes. Um, or they think that you've been in the army. Um, yeah. So actually for me, the way it, it came about or uh, showed itself in my life was that I really struggled with relationships mm-hmm. um, with friendships. Um, there was always this separation between me and other people. So although I could make many, many friends and acquaintances at a superficial level, and although I cared about people, it was really hard to connect further than that. Makes complete and, sense, yeah. Yeah. And I think the other thing is that I was um, having these nightmares every single night. Mm-hmm. So... Um, I would wake up in cold sweats or wake up screaming or frightened. Mm. And I was so fearful of going to sleep. So I wasn't sleeping very well. Um, So, you know, Newcastle Uni was great for me because it gave me this opportunity to blossom. And uh, over the eight years I worked for them, I was able to take on more and more responsibility. Mm -hmm. And um, I moved very quickly up the ranks. And while I was at the university, I decided to um, do a course uh, where everybody else in the room was paid for by their department. Um, it was a 500 pound course that reduced from a thousand and mm-hmm. it was a, a leadership program. Right. And I decided to self fund that 500 pound because it was really important to me that I, I, got that qualification yeah and I remember yeah. people in the room being so shocked you know who is this girl who does she think she is she's like a secretary and oh. she's doing this program um, and it wasn't explicitly said like that but it was no. more you know inferred, everyone else was, inferred yeah. yeah you could exactly. tell by the body language probably <laughs> yeah and also kind of your your role you know when you're introducing yourself and what level you're at and yeah you know you're very kind of green and in, in that way mm-hmm. and um yeah so I did that and I loved it so much and it gave me the confidence to return to university so bearing in mind I studied journalism for a year at Leeds Trinity and All Saints and I then quit and so I didn't get any credits for that year um and what I did then is 
I started uh, distance learning an undergrad uh, leadership and management degree at Northumbria University. Right. And I worked full time and I had several promotions while doing that course and working. So it was a very busy time, but uh, I actually, uh, you know, graduated from that with a, a 2-1, um, which was brilliant. Um, I, I lived in the course. And so I guess that brings us almost up to speed where um, uh, in March this year, after many years of uh, taking risky roles to progress at Newcastle University, I took a maternity cover, which uh, was a, a fixed term, mm-hmm. and um, and my role came to an end. So I decided to apply for an MBA at Newcastle University uh, Business School, which is something I've wanted to do for six years. I'd actually gone to six open days right. over and over and over uh, even when I wasn't even ready yet I just had this vision and this dream of being part of that cohort mm. and I was delighted to be accepted and so I thought okay well I'm, I'm going to get some redundancy money the tuition's incredibly expensive um, so I'm going to use that money towards it and between March and uh, September this year 2019 yeah. yeah I had a lot of time to fill because actually I had um I didn't feel comfortable at the time about going for interview after interview Mm -hmm. for a short time of work. You know, who's going to hire you for six months? Yeah. So I decided I'll just start my own business. And it was very much, well, other people are doing this. I've got some (laughs) skills. You know, I'm sure you will pay for something. Yeah. Um, And we can talk about starting your own business a little bit later. But I mean, it was very much a, let me just give this a try. I'm just going to test it out. Um, and it went really well, actually. I learned a lot of very tough lessons, mm-hmm. which I'll also share. Yes. Um, but actually being able to do the role, um, sorry, to start my own business, I, I really um, was surprised at um, some of the, the things I was able to achieve. And then in September 2019, I started my MBA at Newcastle University. So I am now a student, a society president, and I'm also running a podcast and my own business, <laughs> and it's wonderful. Um, but in theme of my creative chaos uh, personality, yeah. it is so chaotic. Um, uh, but it's for me, it's I, I have so much fun every day. So, and um, that's a bit of a whistle stop to it. Oh, and brilliant! Lots of questions there. Okay, well. F- <laughs> absolutely brilliant and thank you so much for sharing it you know authentically and with integrity and can i just say my sincerest condolences with the loss of your friend um all this time ago and and i'm so sad to hear what you've had to go through and at the same time you know we get these things uh, thrust upon us without expecting it. There is nothing in life that trains you or prepares you for something like that. And then somehow from somewhere, you have to cope with it. I mean, you, you talk about South Africa. And um, I've also lived abroad for a while. I lived for three years in a place called Suriname, which is a, a, used to be a Dutch colony at the top of South America. And um, so I completely concur and and empathize with living in a different environment, a different nation, a different continent, um, and then having to come to travel to a different continent again and having to learn everything that happens there and and being kind of thrust in, in the middle of it all. And the only thing I would say with that, because that happened, although you may not have realized it at the time, it actually made you more prepared for something significant to happen. Now, I remember somebody saying to me years ago when I was in employment and there was lots of change happening in, in the organization. and. A manager, I can't even remember who it was, turned around and said, you think this is change? If you want to know real change is when you lose somebody you love. That's real change. 
change in an organization is nothing. And I had no idea what he talked about. I didn't, I couldn't empathize with what he was saying at all until at the age of 25, I lost my father. Then I realized what he meant with, if you want to know real change, it's when you lose somebody that you love. And uh, so, um, not really sure where I'm going with all of this, but apart from to say that I, I, I do empathize what you're going through or have gone through. I do understand about the PTSD and not for now, but when, when, if I have the, um, the honor of, of being on your podcast, I will definitely share a story of trauma that happened in, in my wife's and my lives in the last five years and how for, how we can even look back on it and go, how did we manage to get through it? We have no idea, you know, and, and that's almost what you've been saying as well. You have no idea how you managed to get through it. And there's, there's help and there's people around you that have supported you and you've helped yourself as well. And, and well done for, you know, making a complete turnaround from having given up education. What, what I mean is having given up your university course in Leeds and now being back doing your MBA, which is just, just fantastic news and all of the other chaos that you're surrounding yourself with. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so thank you for that. And, and so first question, then the follow up question. Uh, with all of the different things that you're doing, um, what came first, the the um, creative consultancy or the podcast? Which way around did it all happen there? It might be useful for me to tell you a little bit about the business. Okay, um, yes, please. And how that kind of worked out. Yeah. So um, this is actually a really useful tip for anybody listening who's feeling stuck, um, who wants to know how to find something that lights them up. So a few years ago, um, I was working in a role that was very finance orientated and very process orientated. Yes. And I was feeling very down because although I graduated, I was um, trying to do a postgraduate certificate in higher education, leadership management and administration, which sounds as boring as the mouthful that it is. <laughs> um, it's actually a brilliant course, but it was the delivery of it was all online and all in essays rather than any video or teaching time. Yeah. So for me, it just didn't work with my personality. And um I did something uh, which I would recommend to anybody. It's a free tool online. It's called the Via Strength, Via Character um, uh, Strength Analysis. Mm -hmm. So I can share the link with you after this podcast. Yeah, great. Um, but what it does is it helps you to answer some questions. It's very much like many of your personality tools out there, and it tells you a bit about yourself. Yes. And so what I did with that is I, I answered the questions, and I was surprised at my strengths, which came up. So everyone is asked the same questions, and it kind of rates your values in your preference. Right. Um, I think they're at 24. And what I was shocked to discover is my lowest value was love of lifelong learning. And I thought to myself, how can that be? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I love reading. I love learning. I'll read a magazine to a newspaper, to a shampoo bottle. Mm -hmm. I want to speak to people and know things. And I'm a sponge, you know, I, learning is one of the things that I love most about my life. Yes. So I, I couldn't understand that, but I think it meant more the kind of academic journal writing paper publica publication type um, learning. Yes. Um, the strengths that came up, the top five for me were the first one was appreciation of beauty and excellence. And I thought, what on earth does that mean? I mean, <laughs> how can you appreciate beauty and excellence and how can that be a strength? Yes. But it started to dawn on me because I'm always late because I'm looking at the ducks, you know, and the, the water in the lake and um, right. the trees and admiring how pretty the trees are. And, um, you know, I always look for beauty in people, uh, no matter what they've done or who they are or, or their background yeah. or circumstances. Um, and I'm always crying at opera or poetry and so moved by these things. 
So that is it, the appreciation of beauty and excellence. It's to be so moved by art or music or any of these things. Mm. Um, you know, I find maths and science beautiful. There's so much art um, in the star system and all of this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so anyway, as uh, so the next one was creativity, which I am really passionate about. Um, I love any opportunity to problem solve or design something mm-hmm. or things like this. The others were kindness, zest, and um, I think courage came up quite high or certainly love. And love in this instance is not just the value of love for a person. It's actually for people as well. Yeah. So when I looked at this, I was really surprised because there were other things on there like discipline and um, clarity, focus, or I can't remember the exact terms, but my strengths were so out of line with what I was doing in my life that I was deeply shocked. Mm. So I started making a conscious effort to only take jobs, only apply for jobs and only take opportunities that would nurture those strengths. Right. Uh, as I started to do that, my life completely changed. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd been applying for jobs and I wasn't getting anywhere in that. You know, I would keep going for it, keep believing something's going to happen, the change will come. Yeah. And yeah. when I started to tap into those strengths, you know, being around people, um, going and doing creative things, it was like this explosion or this outlet of a dam or I don't, you know, it's, I love metaphors, by the way. <laughs> It was it was incredible. This this passion just unleashed yes. inside me. Yes. Um I made the very difficult decision to quit that course, um, which was quite difficult and scary because it had been paid for by my organization, who did get a refund, so that was okay. Yes. But I felt like such a failure and I actually really grieved over that process. Right. But making that decision was really empowering because I had been failing assignment after assignment. And you know, at the time, the story I told myself was I was so stupid and I couldn't do it. And now I'm doing an MBA, which is also a master's and I'm, you know, I'm getting good grades. So I'm not stupid. It just wasn't right for mm, me. Mm. And I think that's an important thing for anybody to know is that sometimes yeah. things don't match who you are or, or, or the plan for you. Mm. And actually it's, it's kind of the universe or a God or a sign from, something telling you that there is a different way even aside from yourself or your intuition so this kind of journey started 2016 2017 of discovering my strength right and over time I started working in roles that were all about people all about creativity art culture communities and um I just kept progressing because I was in line with the work that was there for me you know it it was my path um and uh when my last role came to an end and I was thinking about what I could do well I was thinking okay well I love people I love networking I love communities and I love social media and marketing and things like this yeah and um one of the things I'd done to move ahead in my career was I got to the point where I couldn't really progress without much strategic planning knowledge. So I started to um, volunteer on boards and as a trustee and steering committees and then community projects. And that gave me a lot of experience of different things like fundraising or things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And that gave me the strength and the knowledge to progress. But also um, when I was looking for my, uh, to set up my own business, it had given me tremendous contacts and connections so I started working for um a few different charities and a few different organizations and my idea was that I would do event organizing and help with some social media strategies and um what I found very quickly you know my whole goal was that when I finished in September uh, 2020, my MBA, Mm -hmm. I would be able to go and work and really scale up my business, but it would be all focused around wedding planning. Yes. And when I actually did some research, um, I discovered that only 2% of people in the Northeast of England are looking for a wedding planner. Oh, right. So I was putting loads of effort into a business that was not going to be sustainable. Right. Um, when most people look for a wedding planner, they're looking for a luxury wedding planner because they've got enough money to pay a wedding planner. Yeah. Um, what I was hoping to deliver were these very kind of quirky, 
uh, DIY sort of um, upcycled, recycling friendly, nature oriented ethical weddings. And, you know, that's all great, but it just wasn't going to be uh, work or, or be worthwhile. Yeah. So that was an interesting lesson to learn. And what I did discover as well is, um, you know, I had all these skills and what I've now decided to do is um, my limited company is called uh, Days Like This, our sweet creative consultancy limited. It's mm. a bit of a mouthful. Mm, I like um, it. Thank you. Um, but the whole focus uh, of the, the company is to support um, small businesses and charities mm-hmm. um, and individuals to raise their visibility. So to help them um, in their quest of um getting themselves known so it could be through an event or it could be through um social media strategies through their website through their um newsletters through their marketing whether it's print or digital so social media um linkedin um various different things so um i've now worked with quite a few different clients uh and that was a real passion project but it was very much learning as i went so yeah I've done an Afrofusion festival, a celebration of Malaysian culture, mm-hmm. um, all sorts of different things. But the real focus is on showcasing other cultures and right. other communities and giving a voice um, and a platform. And so whether that's teaching people how they can be better at communicating or actually running an event which showcases a particular culture. Yeah. Um, so this is a huge passion of mine. And as a result of that, I started to realize that there were a lot of people who had these incredible projects they were working on, you know, amazing artists and from many different walks of life. But I'm particularly attracted to working with the black and minority ethnic community. Yeah. The reason being is that um, for me, I've mentioned already how important that growing up in Africa and, um, yes. you know, the time of the rainbow nation and, and yeah. apartheid and all of this kind of stuff. Mm. Um, for me, that is my focus and my passion. So um, that is my, my main priority, I would say, um, in terms of supporting artists and things like that. Yeah. But I started to discover there were all these fabulous people who maybe wouldn't normally um, have the, the chance to pay to raise their profile or, mm. or grow. Mm. So I decided to um, start a podcast. Right. Um, that's how Nurture Your Zest was born. Right. So, um, and yeah, and the podcast is really, uh, you know, it's to help people who are stuck, no matter where they are in their life, what they're doing. And it's kind of me a few years ago, you know, when I was stuck in that office yeah. doing the process, doing the finance, yes. just feeling lost. And it's about how through sharing stories of adversity and the prickly situations in life, mm. how we can, um, you know, develop strategies for resilience using creativity, courage, and curiosity and how mm. we can nurture our zest or nurture your zest is what it's called. Right. Um, so, you know, so far um, I've had wonderful business leaders as guests. But I'm also interviewing people who are self-employed, who've, you know, creative minds, wonderful leaders, um, uh, people who've been through trauma, uh, racism, rape, mm. um, all sorts of different issues like this, mm. depression, suicide, being a single dad, you know, uh, going through a divorce, all of these different elements. And it's about through these stories we can grow together. I do have plans to also, you know, invite some of the, the local artists I was talking about. I have had one on so far. Um, but it's very much about who has a story to tell that yes. would really help people who are stuck. Mm. And that's how Nurture Your Zest was born. Brilliant. That's so nice to to hear how all of what you're doing today was kind of shaped you know in your very young age um and i can really see how why you had to come here why you had to have those experiences in south africa why you had to work with the community there through your grandmother and all of the things that you did at a very very young age and then why eventually through everything that you've been through so far, and you're still really very young, um, that, that you have like a mission to help other people in this way. So I think it's just 
Amazing. Well done, you. Thank you. That's nice of you to say. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's when it's your purpose, when it's your values, it doesn't feel like work. It really lights you up. It's incredible. The change that happens when you find what you were meant to do. Yeah. Um, and for me, I feel like I'm exactly where I'm meant to be. Yeah. And that that is a massive thing. And there are so many people out there who are doing things, work, maybe even running their own business, it doesn't matter, being in relationships or whatever, where they are just not, you know, being themselves. They haven't looked at those values within themselves or what it is that they really desire and, and what what will light them up. And you you once you knew what it was and you started to focus on it. And the thing is, I think the difference with you, Ashley, is that you took action because lots of times we do all of these, you know, analysis on our own personality and we kind of get, put it to one side or put it on the bookcase and go, yeah, that was really interesting and just carry on. Um, you started to take notice and I think that's where the difference is. When you take notice and you do it on purpose, that's when you will find your purpose, um, which is what you're doing. So just a brilliant story. Uh, thank you. And um, it's interesting what you're saying there because I do think I took action, but um, I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression. It hasn't always been easy. And, you know, sometimes it, I have been completely suffocated or um, uh completely absorbed in the trauma that I've gone through mm. that it has been impossible for me to get out of that yeah. you know so I feel for anybody who is currently going through um, the impact of a traumatic situation who may have depression or anxiety and feeling that intense fear of you know it's almost like you cannot move you know you are completely suffocated isn't the right word but you are paralyzed yeah. by fear that, yeah. that's it and um i think in this instance it's worthwhile me letting you know that not only did the experience with what happened to joe happen and you know the murder created that sense of post-traumatic stress disorder yeah. but i also am a survivor of child trauma and rape um and actually being a young girl and going through that mm. it for me, the way I dealt with that is I didn't tell anybody. Mm. I just wanted to be little Miss Perfect because if I was perfect, then it wouldn't happen to me yeah. because perfect girls and good girls aren't dirty and they're not shameful. So if I was good, then then it would stop happening mm. and it would be I would be left alone and I would people wouldn't see how dirty and shameful I was. Mm. You know, and these mm. are the thoughts that went through my head. So as a young girl, you know waking up in the morning if I didn't wake up in a, in a way that I deemed to be perfect or good enough mm. I would pretend to myself to fall back to sleep so I could wake in a way that was you know like sleeping beauty or you know something that I saw on the tv that was that was the right way the yes. good way yes. you know and my whole life if I made a mistake if I'm told a lie at school as a young child, I would have to start the day again in my mind mm. and wipe the slate clean to be perfect. Mm. And it's so much pressure for a young child or for anybody to put on themselves. We are not perfect. We are, sometimes we make mistakes, but it's the courage to face those mistakes and step up to them that really makes a difference. Yes. Um, so in terms of action and taking action, I absolutely agree that I have. And I think, it's possible. But what I would encourage anyone going through a hard time to remember is that, you know, I think sometimes we aren't able to, we, we, we're not ready to. No. And actually, sometimes it can be something like, um, you know, it's really controversial taking medicine for PTSD or for depression and anxiety. But for me, I take everyday sertraline and propanolol, which help me with my anxiety and they, they block that panic and fear. So I know I won't be on that forever, but working with the amazing doctors in the NHS, you know, um, I know that I'm really well looked after. I've had the courage to go to them and say, look, I am a child survivor of trauma and it, I, I need some help. 
and um, they have helped me. Mm. So actually what I didn't realize is until I started taking those tablets, I was so, I was struggling so much. So even just something like your brain chemistry has changed with PTSD. I mean, I'm not a psychologist or a scientist, so um, please gain your own medical advice. But what I would say is when looking at PTSD and looking at things with my therapist and things like that, what I didn't understand is that actually people who have been through post-traumatic stress disorder or who've been through trauma, they are attracted to trauma. So no wonder I create chaos for myself because chaos is safe. And that's where I feel good when it's crazy, you know? So, um, and it's things like, um, you might find, you know, now I create the chaos by surrounding myself with these fabulous projects and diverse projects that light me up yes. and, and get me going. But in the past, it hasn't always been like that. It's been self-destructive, mm -hmm. toxic friends or the wrong friendships, drinking, partying, you know, um, all sorts of other behaviors that um, I, I'm happy to leave behind me now. And I think what I realized is I wasn't doing those things to uh, escape. I mean, of course I was, but also I was doing them to harm myself. That was a form of self-harm. So actually when you when you start to face what's really happened and you, you start to fight for your life and you start to realize that you are worth fighting for, that's a step in the right direction. Um, but it's interesting because with PTSD, uh, you actually have less, um, I'm trying to think of the right word now. I think it's less cortisone. Everybody has a, a basic level that helps them get out of bed in the morning and helps them to get sleep at night. Yes. But when yeah. you have PTSD, you don't have the same levels as other people. So you have a lot of extra stress anyway, and it, um, but you don't have this uh, chemical which helps you get out of bed in the morning and, and sleep. So you are depleted and you are, you are coping with this every day as something, it's almost like an invisible, um, an invisible virus or poison in your body that nobody can see. Mm. And it holds you down. It's like lead you know, weighing you down. And when you start to speak about it, it it's the secret that gives me um, power to the fear. Mm. And when you start to talk about it and embrace it and say, okay, this is really tough, but I'm going to work through this and I'm going to hold this feeling and it's uncomfortable, but I'm going to, I'm just going to own it. You know, yeah. yes, yeah. I, was, I was a rape um, victim, but I am no longer a victim. I am a survivor. This is when the power um, just unleashes all of that secrecy. And it's when you can really claw your life back together. Um, I think some people will go, oh, you know, you've, you've been through therapy. Good for you. You know, not everyone can access that. And what I have to say in that response is I fought so hard for the therapy that I was able to get. Um, I think I went through two years of a waiting list and maybe eight to ten uh, meetings where I went over and over the difficult circumstances and all the trauma and everything that had happened in my family history. And it's really painful going through that process. Yes. And I remember one instance where I'd got to the end of this two-year waiting list and all of these different meetings, and I was told that I would not be eligible for therapy. Mm. And I... I got very upset actually. And it's the first time I can really think of where I fought for myself instead of other people because I'm always fighting for other people. But in this instance, I said, I need this. This will save my life. Yeah. You know, you have no idea how much I need this. And they said, well, why would we offer therapy to someone who's high functioning? You know, you're doing a degree, you're juggling um, a busy job, you, you're getting promoted. You don't have a problem. You know, there's people who need help. And I said to them, well, what you don't understand is that high functioning is not actually coping because that is taking on things to block the fear and the pain. And actually, underneath all of that high performance is actually someone who's very broken and vulnerable. And, I mean, it got quite, um, uh, it got quite uh, angry, actually, um, Anyway, in the end, I, I was able to access the therapy that I needed, but it was very hard to fight for that. And um, I'm still to this day, that is one of my biggest personal achievements for myself is to fight for the, the support I needed.
Wow. Thank you so much for sharing all that. that and it definitely sounds to me like um, it's not the right word when I say you're a fighter um, or I'm, I'm, I'm using that word because I don't, I don't really like that word that much, but it, to me it sounds like you, you know what it is that you need for yourself and you now know what it is that you want to do. And those are two really important things that not everybody has knowledge of. And um, of course, I'm not trying to, you know, reduce or belittle in any way, shape or form everything that you've been through. And at the same time, all of those events in your life have prepared you for the things that you are currently doing and will be doing, um, you know, in the future. Um, because in you sharing your story, we don't know who's going to be listening to this podcast, but I guarantee you there will be somebody out there that has a similar experience and might be inspired to get in touch with you for some, you know, discussion, assistance, information, knowledge or sharing. Um, or just by listening to this podcast will help them, you know, move forward with the things that they're dealing with. So thank you for sharing all of what you've shared so openly. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody who's listening appreciates it as well. Thank you for saying that. Um, I do, I'm open to people contacting me if they want to mm -hmm. as well. And I think it's really important to talk. Um, I'm actually uh, inspired to share my own story because one of my recent guests, Sarah, um, she was very brave and spoke about um, rape. So for her, it was a bit different to mine, not child trauma. Um, as an adult, she's experienced this and experienced it more recently. But it was really empowering and inspiring to hear her story and to, you know, to see how listeners really appreciated her honesty. And, you know, it, it's brutal what she's been through. Um, but actually, the fact that she still has gratitude and courage and positivity is incredible. And it helps me to remember that I too have a story that if I hold on to it and I just keep it, I continue to feed that idea of being Miss Perfect you know, of being that perfect girl. And actually, I'm not perfect mm. and I'm quite happy to not be. And it actually, we all have flaws, but it's our, our flaws and our idiosyncrasies that make us so interesting. Sure. Um, so when you have the courage to remove the mask, it, it, it's just incredible the life that you are able to embrace. Yeah. Okay, Ashley, thank you so much for sharing all of that and, and, and learning about your whole journey and your story. I really appreciate it. It's been really interesting. If people want to get hold of you, learn more, subscribe to the podcast, could you share some links and information on that, please? Sure. So uh, Nurture Your Zest is um, my podcast and you can find it on the website, which is um, www.nurtureyourzest.com. Um, all one word. And um, that is a, a great place to go as a first step because it has the backlog of previous podcasts. You can also apply on there if you'd like to be a guest. Um, and you can also choose your best listening platform. So whether it's Spotify or Google Addict or Podcast Addict, I think it's called, or iTunes or Spotify, Spreaker, all of those different options are there. Or you can just listen on the website. Mm -hmm. um, the best place to find me, I would say, is always going to be on LinkedIn. Um, I am uh, very much uh, interested in leadership interested in creative leadership and, and inclusive leadership, working with communities and people from all walks of life. So I love talking with business leaders and uh, charities, school kids, people from 
various backgrounds. Right. Um, but that's where I'm most likely to reply. Right. Um, so I would say if people want to look me up, it's Ashley King on LinkedIn. Um, I have a very smiley um, picture with a red T-shirt. Um, so you can find me there. Um, I think those are probably the best places. I am on Instagram and Twitter. Um uh, for nurture your zest and um ashy tales is my my twitter handle ashy capital m a s h i e underscore tales and um i didn't mention that days like this are sweet is available at www.dayslikethisarsweet.com at the moment we're rebranding um i'm i'm putting that on hold to focus on nurture your zest and other things while i'm a student right but i know that in future um I'll be really excited to scale that up once I finish my my program next year. Great. Okay. Well, I'll, all those links will be in the notes, the show notes anyway, so people can click through from there or they can, you know, get in touch via LinkedIn and, and um, learn more about you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, I, Newcastle is a long way. I don't know if you ever come into the Birmingham area, but if you do by any chance, then give me a shout. I'm not near, I'm about 40 minutes outside of Birmingham, so I will travel into Birmingham. Um, and maybe we can meet up, I'll buy you lunch and say thank you for coming on the podcast. <laughs> and um, I do know a few people up your way, so I might kind of put them in touch with you if you're interested in some other guests. Um, and Thanks again, and hopefully we will meet in person in the future. Absolutely. I look forward to it. I'm very much a believer in what you wish for will happen, whether it's good or bad. So I am. I know we will meet, my friend. Okay, that's brilliant. Yeah, I really look forward to it, Ashley. Thank you so much for your time. Bye for now. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 